Right, hello everybody. Um, thanks for um, for being interested uh, enough to watch this talk and apologies that the live session didn't work due to broadband failings. Um, so, I wanted to talk to you today about how how should teachers engage with education research? Um, and really, <clears throat> I think this is a really important issue. Um, I work in a place called the Centre for Mathematical Cognition, where we study how um, people learn mathematics, essentially, how people engage with mathematical ideas, how they come to understand mathematical concepts. And it would be nice, well, I, it seems to me that some of that work has implications for practice. Um, so an interesting and important question is, well, how do we communicate the findings of research of the type that we do in my centre and elsewhere, of course, to educational practitioners? Um, so the rough outline of my argument is that education, in, uh, uh, sorry, evidence in education is really important. I think there's broad agreement about that now. But there is disagreement about the best method to, to communicate evidence to teachers. Um, one of the most common ways of doing this is using a technique called standardised effect sizes. And I'll talk a bit about what they are and um, what I regard the problems of them to be. Um, and then I'll also uh, introduce a new problem, another problem, a slightly different problem, um, to do with the flexibility of analytical choices that researchers have when conducting um, research studies. And I'll suggest that this too has implications for um, for the use of standardised effect sizes as a method of communicating research to teachers. Um, but I'll also then go on to suggest that thinking about that, um, about that issue um, suggests a solution. And I'll talk about how um, the work of a guy called Douglas Mook and his view of two different ways of thinking about, uh, about research uh, to practice, the research practice relationship. And I'll end up by concluding that really what, it's, what we should be communicating to practitioners is theoretical understanding, not findings. So that's roughly what I want to persuade you of by the end of the talk. So let's get going. So um, you may be familiar with this work by a guy called John Hattie. Um, he wrote various books in this series of visible learning. Here's one called Visible Learning for Teachers, which apparently um, has all the books in this series together have apparently sold uh, over a million copies. So very, very influential. And what John Hattie does is he does what's called a meta-analysis, various meta-analyses. Well, in fact, he does meta-meta-analyses. So a meta-analysis is where you summarise the findings, the findings of a large number of studies on similar-ish things um, and produce an overall estimate of the effect of the, the, the thing you've summarised. So, for example, you might say, I'm interested in how... Um, you know, whether wearing school uniform influences uh, people achievement, people attainment. And various people have done studies on this. You might somehow take an average of all of those studies, perhaps weighted for the size of the, um, for the size of the study. So bigger studies probably should carry more weight in your average. And then you, you get an overall average of the effect of wearing school uniform on attainment. And fundamental to this way of thinking about communication is what's called standardised effect sizes. So you end up with diagrams a bit like this. Um, so let me make that a little bit bigger for you. So for example, here is a diagram taken from uh, a visible learning uh, website, I think. And for example, you can see some of the, some educational activities so the summer vacation, that has a negative effect on learning. Um, whereas others, um, so for example, teacher clarity, um, have a positive effect on learning. And what Hattie does is he summarises the size of these effects using what's called a standardised effect size. So that's a negative standardised effect size. The ones over here are apparently point, minus point 0.2. Over here, they're, they're much bigger. Um, and I'll say a bit about what they are in a second. Um, and there's a similar thing to Hattie, uh, but run by the Education Endowment Foundation. So this was an organisation set up by the UK government in 2011, 
um, and they do a lot of interesting things. It's by, they're by far the biggest funder of education research in Britain. Primarily they fund randomised controlled trials and meta-analyses. And what they do is they, they share their findings with teachers in a kind of toolkit um, of standardised effect sizes. So it's kind of like Hattie, but I think there's some improvements on, well, many improvements actually. I think it's a kind of uh, a superior version of Hattie, but it's along the same kind of alliance. So you may, you may see things like this. So in this is, in fact, this was relaunched very recently. So this uh, has nice, nice new graphics and stuff and it's been tweaked a bit. So you can see that they talk about various things. So arts participation is the first, um, is the first thing that is on the, um, first thing that, that, that they're trying to summarize. And they tell you how much arts participation is gonna cost, not very much apparently, how much evidence there is to support it. Uh, apparently it's three out of five in terms of the, the quality and quantity of evidence, but most importantly is the impact. And they quote this in terms of months of progress. So you can see, you can, you can order these things by, um, by how many months of progress they, they generate or the effects they have on impact uh, on attainment. So for example, apparently repeating a year has a negative effect on attainment by three months of progress. Um, and then things like performance pay for teachers, has a small positive um, effect, so one month of progress apparently. And then some things, so for example, metacognition and self-regulation, which is kind of a broad category, um, has seven months of progress. So apparently if you do these things, that, that you, your, your students will make seven additional months of progress. Um, and what are these months of progress? Well, they're actually just a uh, direct linear relationship between uh, months of progress and the effect sizes that Hattie uses. So they're, they're just a, a supposedly a teacher-friendly way of reporting uh, effect sizes. So let's delve in a bit on what these effect sizes are. Well, um, they're actually Cohen's Ds, which is a, a more technical way of describing them because there's lots of different sorts of effect sizes. Um, most of these are Cohen's Ds. So let me tell you a bit about how you calculate the Cohen's D, what sort of research design you need to, um, to get a Cohen's D. So imagine you have um, a big group of people, these gray people here, and you're interested in, um, seeing whether a, um, an educational intervention has a positive effect or not. Uh, you know, is it, is it effective at, at getting students to learn things? So what you do is you randomly allocate half of these people into an experimental group. So these are the blue people here and you get them to do, you, you deliver in some sense the intervention to them. So maybe, you know, if you've got some new way of teaching algebra, you teach in that way to this experimental group. The other half of the people go into this red group, the control group, and they do something else. So uh, one interesting thing is it's not entirely clear what they do. Maybe they just carry on with their normal lessons. Maybe they don't do anything. Um, maybe they do some other intervention to help you learn algebra. So there's different ways you can design this. Um, and of course that affects how you should interpret the results. Um, and then, so both of these groups do, these, do their activities, the experimental activity or the control activity, and then you give them some kind of outcome measure. So you give them some kind of test of attainment, some kind of exam or, or whatever. And then you calculate the mean performance in the two groups. So you have the mean of these blue people, uh, the experimental groups mean, and you have the mean of the control group, um, these red people. That gives you those two quantities. And then D is just the difference between those two means um, expressed as a multiple of the pooled standard deviation. So you can imagine that the difference between these two quantities here gives you some kind of measure of the difference between the two groups. And that's why it's really important you understand what the control group has done, by the way, because if the control group has done nothing, you're going to get a different difference than if the control group has learned about the topic, but it's just in a different way. So that's obviously going to affect how you interpret that difference. But the problem with just quoting that, well, the perceived problem with just quoting the difference, so just X bar for the experimental group minus X bar for the control group, is that that clearly depends on the test you use. So if you use uh, a really long test, those means, say you have an 100 item test, those means are gonna be different numerical values to if you just have a 10 item test. So the idea is that you deal with that 
by dividing by the pooled standard deviation, so SP there. And because standard deviations have the same units as means, um, that makes this unitless quantity D. And the idea is that that's hopefully um, uh, gives you some kind of some independent, in some sense, um, way of quantifying the impact of your uh, intervention. And that's really how advocates of this approach talk about it. So this is a, a quote from a piece of writing by Kay and Higgins, who described these standardised effect sizes as being magical. Um, they are magical as they enable communication between researchers around the world. Without effect sizes, an impact on, an ATAR, on ATAR scores in Australia would be incomparable with impact on a GCSE score in England. Um, so the idea is, if, if you adopt this view, that by standardising, simply dividing by the standard deviation, you, you magically make everything comparable. And I think that's just not true um, for the following reasons. And I think the re these reasons are quite important and they suggest a serious flaw with this way of communicating research, which I, I don't think can be fixed. So the basic problem is that standardised effect sizes are biased by anything, anything at all, that alters the variance, but not the effect. So for example, you can see here, if you want to change D, you can do that in one of two ways, either by changing the, the gap between X, uh, the two, this mean and that mean, or by changing the variance, or the standard deviation, the square root of the variance. So you can, changing that also changes D. So standardised effect sizes are biased by anything that changes the variance, but not the effect, the bottom of the fraction, not the top. But unfortunately, that's, that's a lot of things. Um, so if you are studying a group with a small achievement range, for example, um, then you're going to have smaller variance, of course. So uh, you're going to get different, different standard, pool standard deviations for a study that focuses on, um, that focuses on uh, students that study in mixed attainment groups than stream groups, for example. Um, the age of the group, that varies the variance as well. Older children tend to be more variable because they've had kind of more time to diverge. The length of the test changes it. The longer the test, as long as it's a good test, typically the more accurate your measurements. So the um, less noise you have in your design, so the smaller the variance. Um, choice of covariance as well. So sometimes people do things like control for socioeconomic status or so, so on and so forth, other things, prior attainment maybe. And what that does is it, again, removes noise from your experimental design, um, which has the effect of reducing the variance because there's less variance due to unrelated things. Let me give you a brief example. So a, a study I did some years ago now with Lara Alcock found, we were interested in, I mean, it doesn't really matter what we were doing, but we essentially did an RCT to compare, to, to study the effect of a technique called self-explanation training and we found a D of 0.95. So our training for helping students to read mathematical proofs was um, was had, a, had an effect size of 0.95 for our test. Our test had 14 items. Um, if we randomly deleted seven of those items and then recalculated everyone's scores and reran all the statistics, then the D dropped to 0.81. Uh, if we randomly deleted nine items, so we had a five item test, then the D was 0.7. So you can see that having a five item test compared to a 14 item test has a difference of two months of progress if you if you accept this translation between effect sizes and months of progress. And that seems wrong, right? It doesn't seem that the same intervention can have a completely different effect um, depending on which test you use to evaluate it. That feels like it shouldn't be the case. And the reason is because we've manipulated the variance. A 14 item test has, um, has lower variance. Um, and so I think the conclusion you should draw from this is any, any communication strategy that relies on standardised effect sizes, like the EEFs, is potentially misleading. Well, actually misleading. And I'm not the first person to make this point, of course. This is a very fairly standard complaint about standardisation in... Um, applied statistics. So this is a lovely paper by Tom Bagley, which I, I advocate everyone reads. 
um, where he, he argues that um, in general we should prefer simple effect sizing, so just the difference in the means, not the difference in the means divided by the standard deviation. And in general that's better because it's more transparent and it has units. Um, and if it's not the case that getting rid of those units improves um, accessibility or improves comparability between contexts, we shouldn't be doing it, argues Tom. And I, I strongly agree with that point. Um, slightly more, more um, peculiarly, Chuki, who was an influential statistician from some time ago now, uh, proposed creating this thing called the Society for the Suppression of the Correlation Coefficient. Um, and a correlation coefficient has, is essentially just a similar kind of standardized effect size, but it's a standardized regression coefficient rather than a standardized mean difference. But it's the same issues apply. Um, and he said the society's guiding principle is that most correlation coefficients should never be calculated. So what he means by this is um, rather than report a standardized correlation coefficient, it would be much better just to report the slope with the original units, the slope of the relationship between two variables. And if you go to the, the someone, I think I think maybe even Tom, but I'm not sure. Someone set up this website, and if you go to it, you can find 27 critiques of standardised effect sizes in the bibliography. So this is a, a common, well-known issue. It's not um, of people saying, look, you know, this is this can be really quite misleading to standardise effect sizes, to standardise effect sizes, with the, the belief that simply dividing by the standard deviation makes two incomparable things comparable. It doesn't. So that's one reason why we should be very worried about this way of communicating findings to teachers. So the idea of the main output of a study is a finding, a number, an effect size. Um, the effect size doesn't really capture the effect. Here's another problem with this approach to communication. So when conducting a research study, researchers have a large number of analytical choices they have to make. So there's different ways of analyzing the data. And that's true both when you're designing, but also just when you're deciding how to do the analysis. So for example, you can decide how, how to exclude outliers if you want, you can decide what covariates to include, you can tweak which statistical tests you choose. There's all sorts of different things you can do. And it's not always clear what the right, you know, or even if there is a right approach, you know, there's lots of defensible ways of doing statistical analyses. So just give an example of this. This is a really nice project that happened a few years ago now the crowdsourcing data analysis project. Um, and what these people did is they, they, um, they got 29 different independent research teams to um, use the same data set to answer or try to answer the same research question. So the research question was, are football referees more likely to give red cards to dark skinned players compared to light skinned players? And they had this big database of player referee interactions, um, which had the player's skin colour rated by some independent raters and various other things in it. Um, you know, loads of other variables, player's position, height, weight, country, all that kind of stuff. And the task was for each independent research team to come up with an analysis strategy that would answer that question and then produce an estimate of the size of the effect. So there were 29 teams and they came up with all sorts of different, as you might imagine, all sorts of different statistical approaches to this. So simple regression models, to multi-level models, Poisson models, Bayesian analyses, all sorts of different ways of doing this. And indeed there were 21 out of the 29 teams, there were 21 different combinations of covariates. So 21 different ways of answering this question, all of which the coordinators of the project considered a reasonable, you know, all of which were defensible. They, no one came up with something stupid or something just objectively wrong. All of these approaches were reasonable. So each of the approaches led to a standardised effect size, a slightly different standardised effect size to the ones I've been talking about, but that doesn't really matter. Um, the same principles apply. And we can ask this question, what is the effect size of skin colour on referee behaviour? Um, and the answer is it really depends on which analysis method you choose. So some of the, each of these dots is a research team. Some of these um, research teams found there was no effect. You know, um, referees were not more likely to give red cards to dark-skinned players than white-skinned players. Others found an enormous effect, but most of them were somewhere in the middle. Now, I think this this is quite a, a profound 
study actually because I think what it tells you is that the question what is the effect of skin color on red card frequency is not a is not a well formed question you know so standardized effect sizes are highly dependent on subjective analytical choices the effect size doesn't exist the effect size only exists relative to your measure and relative to your analytical choices. There's no, there's no correct answer to this. But despite that, the message of that data is, is pretty clear. So the vast majority of the research teams would be willing to say that red cars were more likely to be given to dark skin players, even if they disagreed by how much. So if you look again here, you can see the vast majority of of research teams found an effect but disagreed a bit about the size of it. Few exceptions because there's some people down here who didn't find an effect. Um, but the message overall seems pretty clear. There is a relationship between um, skin colour and red card frequency but we don't, it's not really meaningful to ask what the effect size of that effect is. Um, you could ask about it for a given analytical choice in a given data set with a given dependent measure, but not, not in general. So we can't say this. We can't say the effect size of skin colour on the frequency of red cards is some number. That's the effect size claim, which is what Hattie and the EEF toolkit try and produce. We can't say that in this context, but we can say skin colour has an effect on the frequency of red cards. So that note the difference there, right? We're making a theoretical claim. There is causal relationship, that's the claim we want to try and make anyway, um, um, but we can't quantify it, there's no, the, the effect size doesn't exist. Okay, so this brings me on to, to this paper which is, talks about related issues. Um, it's a really wonderful paper this, if you ever uh, feel like reading a, uh, a paper um, a psychology journal uh, article. This is the one I would recommend. So this is a paper by Douglas Mook who wrote a paper called In Defense of External Invalidity. And really what he was trying to say is often psychologists are criticized for having very artificial settings in their studies. And what Mook said was that's kind of the point. You know, often that's what we want because what we're, we're not trying to make our studies realistic. We're doing something else. So I think the way I like to think about this is to compare and contrast two ways you can think about the relationship between experimental evidence and the real world. So one way is, is this. You have some experimental evidence, so some RCTs or whatever, and you try and generalise the findings of, the, of that research to the real world. So you take your experimental work and you generalise it to the real world. And in that context, it really matters if your experimental evidence has been created in some crazy artificial set setting. And it really matters what the size of your observed effect is, because that tells you something important about how it's going to generalise and what kind of um, what, what we can expect in the real world. And Mook's point is a lot of research is not like that at all. A lot of research is much more like this. So in this model, it's quite different. What we do is we, we run experimental studies, RCTs, lab experiments, whatever. And the point is to generalise what we learn from that to our theoretical understanding of the world. Right? And we have some theoretical understanding of the world, which we then test by running more, more experiments, more RCTs, more lab studies, whatever. Which generalises again back to the theoretical understanding. We go in some kind of loop around there, to just incrementally improving our theoretical understanding of the world. If we want to have an impact on the world, it's that theoretical understanding we apply. We don't apply the experimental evidence itself. It's the theoretical understanding we gain from the experimental evidence that we want to apply to the real world. And in that way of thinking about research, the size of the observed effect is kind of not that important because the point of the experiment is designed, the, you know, what's the point of running an experiment? It's not to try and estimate the size of the effect. It's to test our theoretical understanding um, and thereby improving it. That's all it's for. Um, okay, let me give you the example uh, that Mook gives, which is a, a really nice, clear example, I think. So um, Harlow uh, is a very classic psychology study, which um, he asked, what is motherly love? Right? So apparently in the 50s, 
there were two kind of big theories of motherly love. And one said, one really emphasised hunger reduction. So the idea was you, children form an attachment with their mothers because it's their mothers that give them food. Um, so this is, that's, you know, makes perfect sense. But there was a slightly different way of thinking about it because uh, the emerging attachment theory, which was that children love their mothers because attachment, these relationships are important for social and emotional development. So the food is much less important. And Harlow tried to distinguish between these two models of motherly love, so these two theoretical understandings, by running this really classic study um, and with this paper with a, a fantastic title, The Nature of Love. Um, and what he did is he, he created two, um, two fake uh, mothers uh, for monkeys. So here is a wire monkey mother uh, who dispenses food, right, dispenses milk through that little thing there. But it's made out of wire and looks a bit weird and, you know, hard to form an attachment with a wire monkey, monkey mother. Um, and then here is a cloth monkey mother without food. So the monkey can sort of cuddle up to the cloth monkey mother, um, but is not going to get any food. And the idea was, well, let's give monkeys um, the opportunity to spend some time with these mothers. Um, what happens if you scare the baby monkey? Which mother, to which mother does it turn when it's worried? And it turns out you can scare baby monkeys by like showing them a strange toy or something, nothing too serious. Um, and the answer is the, 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 the monkey goes to the cloth monkey mother. Um, there it is, uh, it sort of huddles on there for help and support. And there's the data. So you can see that um, most, um, most go to the cloth mother all the way through, but that, that effect gets bigger with age. And imagine the effect size, right? So by the age of uh, 62 days old, it, almost none of the... Um, None of the baby monkeys are are going to the wire mother. Massive effect size there. So let's think about this study. It's an absolutely classic psychology study. So the, the point Mook makes, and I think it's a really, really important point, is that Harlow studies are not considered important because they tell us, I mean, he's obviously not suggesting that it would be a bad idea to replace real world mothers with, with wire mothers, right? No, I mean, you know, that's not, that's no one's proposing that um, wire mothers should be rolled out. So finding that wire mothers are a bad idea is not is not the point. And certainly, MOOCs, uh, Harlow studies, sorry, are not considered important because they have massive effect sizes. But they are considered important because they allow us to test theories about what motherly love is. And these these theories do tell us actually things quite important about how childcare should be organised. So in particular, it's just not adequate to simply provide children with food. That's not enough for their emotional and social development. And this tells us the things, you know, about how, how uh, looked after children need to be looked after, for example. So there is absolutely important implications from this work, real world implications, but not based on the effect size and not based on the experimental setup itself, based on the theoretical understanding that those things allow us to generate. So. But the claim I would like to make is that not much educational research is, is of this form, where you generalise directly from the experimental evidence to the real world situation. But lots and lots of educational research is like this, where you sort of go around in this loop, generating and testing theoretical understanding, and the theoretical understanding is what we should be applying to the real world. And if that's right, um, if I'm right about that, then standardised effect sizes don't really tell you very much about that kind of research because it's the, typically it's the presence of the effect that is testing the theoretical understanding, not, not its size. You know, the fact that um, the effect in the monkey case was in that direction, not that direction, is much more important than the size of the effect. So the fact they ran to the cloth mother, not the wire mother, uh, not the wire mother is the interesting thing there not the relative frequencies. Okay, I think the other thing to say about this is if I'm right about there's two different ways of communicating research to teachers, we need to communicate those two different types of research in really quite different ways. So it's, I guess it's just about possible 
that effect sizes might be useful for communicating research of that sort, that sort to teachers. Although I don't think so, because of the um, the reasons I've talked earlier about how effect sizes can be misleading. But you can imagine a situation where there was a battery of agreed outcome measures for various different things, and maybe we all stuck to those, and that would get around some of these problems. Maybe you can just about imagine, but it's going to be pretty rare, I think. But I just don't think they are useful for communicating those kind of research studies. And it's particularly problematic when someone does a meta-analysis taking this kind of theoretical understanding kind of research, where the original researchers are not interested in the effect size, but the meta-analyst imposes the effect size lens onto that kind of research, um, and uh, and thereby, I think, rip, you know, rips it out of its original context, where the effect size is just not going to be that meaningful. Um, so, the implication, I think, is that a lot of research communication should be about theory, not effect sizes. So, what do I mean by this? If you accept this argument, then we need to stop communicating Hattie-style effect sizes to teachers and start communicating theory. Um, so, how might that work? Well, I think there's we've now got some, some good models which we can compare and contrast of different ways of communicating research to teachers. So, let's compare and contrast these three I've told you a bit about Hattie and the EEF toolkit. I haven't told you much about the Dean's, well, I haven't told you anything about the Dean's for Impact Science of Learning report, but I think it's a really nice example of this theoretical approach to research communication. So here's Hattie's approach, and you, um, you end up with claims like this, that self-reported grades have an effect size of 1.3, um, which is a, is a very peculiar claim, I think. Um, and okay, uh, there's all sorts of problems with that on top of the ones I've, I've, I've mentioned, but I won't go into that now. Then you have a more sophisticated version of that, which comes from the EEF toolkit. And they say things like, well, extending school time a bit leads to three months additional progress. Um, and that, as I say, that's just an effect size. And the nice thing about the EEF approach is you can then sort of dig through and discover what they're on about a bit. Um, but I think that still has these big, big problems, is it's summarising research that's designed to test theoretical understanding, but imposing a, a direct findings generalisation to the real world um, model of research onto research that doesn't actually fit that model. So how does the Deans for Impact Science of Learning report work? Well, it's, this is an example page from it. Um, and you can see it's very, very different. So. It has this theoretical understanding of how humans learn over here. So it has this description of how learning works um, from a cognitive perspective in this case. And it has some possible implications for the classroom. And it has some references to these lab studies that were designed to test the theoretical understanding. And what you'll notice about this page, and this is a typical page, um, is that there's no effect sizes at all. So there's no actual findings reported here. There's just the theoretical understanding that those findings supported. Um, and it's a really nice example of how to do this kind of communication, I think. And I would strongly recommend that all, um, all teachers engage with the Science of Learning, Deans for Impact Science of Learning report, which is freely available on the internet. It's a really nice piece of work. OK. So I think what's going on here is that the Hattie EEF approach assumes research follows this model, this experimental evidence directly generalising to the real world model, whereas the Deans for Impact approach to communication assumes the other way, that experimental evidence is designed to generate theoretical understanding, and it's that that is applied to the real world. So I think that's what's behind these different ways of communicating. One slightly alarming thing is apparently we're not very good at the second approach. So this is a um, recent, well not that recent I suppose, five years or so ago, from the a report from the National Council on Teacher Quality. And they they said, they, they did these analyses on American teacher preparation textbooks and said that there were six uh, research proven instructional strategies, so things like the spacing effect, um, self-explanation, that kind of thing, um, which just weren't included. They were rarely appeared in these in these textbooks. So apparently we do have more of a theoretical understanding on learning than we're communicating uh, to teachers, at least in the US. I don't, um, 
So we're not, I mean, I don't think the research basis on the learning is that strong, but what, what we do have, apparently we're not communicating. So I do want to, before I finish, I do want to say a little bit about how this can, you know, even if you accept my argument and say, yeah, it's this theoretical understanding we need to be communicating. Um, I do want to make the point that communicating theory to teachers is difficult and it can go wrong. So it's a, it's a skilled job, it seems to me. What we really need is these high quality reviews that synthesize the literature, draw out relatively uncontroversial theoretical points, like the Deans for Impact Science of Learning report. And I think one, of the, one issue we have is writing these is really quite hard, and it's not entirely clear whose responsibility it is. I think um, academics don't have a great incentive um, for writing such things, such things um, given the incentive structures in academia. And I think teachers um, don't really have the time to, to write such things. So it's not really clear who, who should be doing that. Um, and that's, I think, is a problem. And there are good and bad examples of this. So I've told you about the science, um, the uh, Dean's for Impact Science of Learning Report, which I think is a wonderful example. Um, ooh, for some reason, <laughs> some reason that's blank. I also could say there's the EEF that has nice examples of this. So the recent uh, maths subject reviews from the EEF, I think, are, are nice examples of this kind of, of review. Um, but there's also bad examples, right? And I think it's it's really worth emphasising that this can be done really badly. Um, I think the Ofsted review of research on maths learning that came out fairly recently is an example of a, of a bad piece of uh, theory communication. Uh, I'll say a little bit more about that about that in a second. So here, for example, is a is the um, EEF recent guidance report on improving maths in the early years in Key Stage One, and it's a really nice piece of work. This so it's it's doing exactly what I say, drawing out some theoretical understandings about what what is required to learn mathematics in the early years in Key Stage One. So I do recommend uh, if any. Uh, teachers in that age range uh, want to learn about um, this, you know, what, what research tells us about the learning of mathematics and what implications that might have. That's a nice example using this communication style I'm advocating here. Um, what I wouldn't recommend is this Ofsted review which came out uh, this year, which I think is a really bad example of research communication because it takes um, it takes research studies and draws implications from them that simply cannot legitimately be drawn. So it draws causal implications from studies uh, which are purely correlational, um, that kind of thing. And um, in the latest issue of the ATM journal, um, Maths Teaching, um, my colleagues Camilla um, and various colleagues, um, Camilla Gilmore and colleagues, have a really nice review of, of that review, um, which I would recommend to people who, who, who are not familiar with the, the reason lots of researchers are very worried about this, um, this Ofsted review. And they explain a bit about um, the dangers of over, over concluding from research studies that simply can't support it. So I, I don't want to give you the impression that the kind of research communication I'm talking about, this drawing out theoretical understandings and communicating that is easy. It's not easy, it's really hard. It's a, it's a difficult, skilled job. Um, but that's not to say we shouldn't try, and there are good examples of it. So let me just summarize then. So my claim um, is that the main output of educational research is, is a theoretical understanding of learning and educational settings is not specific findings or meta-analyzed meta findings. Um, if you accept that, and I hope I've given you arguments, persuasive arguments why you should accept that, but if you do accept that, then um, communication models that rely on telling teachers about standardized effect sizes from RCTs or meta-analyses, they, they've got to be flawed. Um, in the vast majority of situations, randomized controlled trials and meta-analyses meta-analyses they really can only be useful if they test theories and even then if they test theories if they're testing theories it's not clear why you would ever need a standardized effect size unstandardized effect sizes seem to do the job perfectly adequately um, and if you're interested in a tangible example of the kind of thing I'm talking about I think the Deans for Impact Science of Learning report is a really really good model 
Okay. Um, so thanks. Uh, thanks for watching. Um, I hope at least some of that was interesting. And I'll stop there.